starting here and we'll introduce our panel. So this is actually our last session for the week. Um, we've had, I think, 13 in total and they've really been uh, very interesting, very diverse. So I would encourage you to take a look back at our recordings and our slides from the week and there may be something of interest to you. Uh, but today you are here for a panel presentation talking about program design at scale. And the campuses that are represented here are part of our SUNY Online pilot, um, the Degrees at Scale um, initiative through SUNY Online. And our moderator is Chuck Spuchas. He is our Provost Fellow for SUNY Online. And our panelists today are Jennifer Goodall, the Vice Dean and Service Assistant Professor at the um, College of Emergency and Homeland Security and Cybersecurity at the University of Albany. Um, Terry Keyes, Associate Vice President for Instructional Services and Academic Services at Monroe Community College. Danielle O'Brien, Director of Online Learning at Alfred State College. Francesca Cicello, Director of International Education at Empire State College. And Molly Ma, Associate Provost and Dean of Academic Support Services and Instructional Technologies at SUNY Canton. And um, I'm gonna um, turn it over to Chuck, if you want to say anything, and then you can kind of lead the, the script. Here. Actually, Kim is here, Erin. Oh, perfect. Well, let's Maybe have in. Kim give a little bit of an overview sure. about SUNY Online, and then we'll move into our panelists. Hey, everybody. Apologies for being late. I got stuck in email. Um, <laughs> it happens, right? Um, so uh, um, I'll just say a few words quickly. I think, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, well know we have this SUNY Online Degrees at Scale initiative that uh, we've been working on for more than a year now. We've just completed the first year pilot. Uh, and as we move into this next year, a big piece of our focus is really on thinking about program design at scale and really thinking about how we structure curricula and courses and programs uh, so that we can uh, achieve that scale of getting to a thousand students or more per program. Uh, and there are multiple approaches to that. And our campuses who are part of the pilot with us um, have begun to make some um, inroads and some efforts in the way that they think about their program design. So we wanted to take the opportunity of this um, panel during National Distance Learning Week to share some of that with you and to give you some insights into the um, uh, early efforts of our pilot campuses. And I think I'll just stop there because we really wanna hear from from all of them. Um, and I should give a big um, shout out to Chuck Spuches, who um, along with others on our team has really been helping to lead the charge of uh, how we think about program design at scale. And so uh, really grateful to have Chuck on our team um, leading this part of the effort. Thank you, Kim. We have a great team and it's, it's awesome to be part of it. So thank you, thank you. And thanks Aaron for all you've done to set the stage for all of this, that's a lot. So um, good to see everyone, thank you. And uh, we have, as Kim said, uh, a terrific panel of colleagues who are at the heart of SUNY Online, of this initiative, uh, building it um, brick by brick and leading the way and embracing innovation. Uh, so that's, uh, that's inspiring in every regard. I'd like to ask our panel to share um, your experiences as they relate to your campus's participation in the SUNY Online pilot. And for all of you, I think probably this isn't your first uh, webinar this week. Aaron has set it up so that it, this is informal. So please chat, right, Aaron, um, or ask questions. Uh, we want to hear from you and our panel uh, wants to interact with you. So, uh, Jen, um, how about we begin with you? Uh, you've uh, been thinking about designing courses for large enrollment, which is a big part of what SUNY Online is aspiring to. So um, how about you start us off? Sure. So let me just, okay. Um, so thank you, um, everybody. I just wanted to give a little background first. Um, I'm going to talk about what I call quote unquote big online courses. I, I put them in quotes because they're big to some people and not big to other people. Um, a little bit of background. We have um, two of our programs are we're part of the SUNY online pilot and now are part of SUNY online, um, which both existed as online programs prior to SUNY online. So we had the MS in information science and a BS in informatics, each of those have different concentrations. 
Um, so I've listed out here all of the concentrations within the majors, but the ones without STARS are the ones that are available fully online. So pre-SUNY online, um, obviously resources were tight, enrollments are growing, and um, the way to handle that was to, to think about making our classes bigger. Um, the standard on campus sort of urban legend was 25 is the right size for an online class. But some people, not in our programs, but on campus, were already doing big online classes. Hundreds is sort of how they would have defined big. Um, so we had a small pot of funding um, to pilot some larger classes, and we relied on primarily adjuncts to do that. Um, and then spring of 20, we went online as a SUNY online um, uh, set of programs. So our enrollments are growing, resources are tight. Um, by being part of the pilot, we needed even bigger courses. Um, now we're involving full-time and part-time faculty. Uh, we started to dedicate small um, allotments of TA support for bigger classes. Um, and one of the things that I would recommend to everybody else who considers doing this is we actually started a bit of a support group for people teaching big online. So we would get together a couple of times over the course of the semester to say what's working, what's not working, um, and just share ideas and resources. And I think that was one of our best moves in the spring. Um, and here we are this year where now, because of um, COVID and SUNY Online, everything that we've done is now more. So we have more people teaching courses, um, big online courses, if they were part of SUNY Online, just because we have more students, but also um, more people teaching big online courses because they were scheduled to teach on campus. Um, and given the fall um, with COVID, we're not able to. So we've basically established a new baseline. So we went from the every online course can be no more than 25 to really 36 is the floor for, and that I would not consider 36 a big online course. That's just where we start at the undergrad level and around 30 for the grad courses. So um, because I actually don't teach a big online course, I went to our instructors who do and I say, okay, I said, I'm doing this presentation on Friday. If you could give a tip, and a challenge, what would you give me? So this is really where these um, quotes have come from, are people who are teaching big online courses. Again, big online for us um, is more around the 75 to 150 size. Um, and we do give grading support um, for those classes. So that is referred to in some of these comments. So, I mean, one of the biggest ones um, is to redesign the assessments. Um, and this particular instructor taught 75 last spring, 120 this fall, and is, um, I think, scheduled for something like 160 in the spring um, of 21. And his attitude was, now that I've built it, I can really scale it. Um, so, you know, as long as he's got a TA to help him with the processing of grades, um, he says to just keep, keep sending them my way. Another instructor um, recommended that you humanize the course, and this is something that he does in his face-to-face -face courses, small online courses and big online courses, is really just to let the students know that he's a human being. Um, it can seem really easy as we sort of hide behind cameras or cameras off or you know, fully asynchronous um, to, to think that there's nobody else there. Um, so, you know, whether sharing videos or voice thread to really humanize the course. Um, something that people found, and I think a lot of people who have used Zoom have found this um, to be the case too, is if you have someone else to help. So this is in reference to a um, synchronous online course of 200, more than 200 students, but just having somebody there to let the late students in, to mute people, answer the basic questions in chat, um, we, this, um, actually, this instructor, um, the first day of our fully online, um, when we went remote in the spring, was Zoom bombed before we had a phrase for that. Um, and so she really sort of set the standard for, okay, you always need to have a backup. Um, this um, last one here is, sort of relates to the first one. You really have to automate as much of the grading as possible. And that's a challenge that some of our online instructors found was they wanted to sort of teach it how they had always taught it. And you really can't do that um, when you're talking about hundreds of people online. Additional tips um, sort of goes without saying, communicate, communicate, communicate. 
Um, but the tools are built, um, the platform is built to be able to do a lot of communication. And this uh, um, instructor is just saying, use those tools, whether it be a weekly email update, again, to let them know that you're there, um, having office hours, doing announcements, but just to over communicate with the students. Um, the next one about using the platform to your advantage, again, I mean, students are always asking, for example, about grades. I don't know where I stand. I don't know what my grade is. But if you're using Blackboard, it, it can calculate all of that. It just takes an upfront investment to build it that way. Um, and the more the instructors can, can prepare the course so that things are automated, the more connected the students feel with it. Um, and then again, communications and expectations. So um, using, using different tools, those tools are there. We're fortunate in our fields um, because we are technology fields that the students tend to be pretty tech savvy um, and using things like Slack or other communication tools is pretty much what they'll be using in their careers. So we tell them, you know, you may be taking um, an asynchronous class where you feel disconnected, but you also might be in a job next year where you're working across time zones and across platforms. And so that's, this is just sort of preparing you for what's to come. The next part I asked were about challenges. Um, and so I, I think one challenge that I personally feel not so much in class, but is this tension between synchronous and asynchronous courses. Um, I think because so many um, experiences overall went online, I think that's different than saying um, it's an online program at scale when we say like, oh, everybody now teaches online. It's really quite different. I think there's a different intention. And I think that the goal of SUNY Online and programs at scale are to be asynchronous so that students can have that flexibility. At the same time, on campus, we're feeling a bit of a tension between, but this is how our students stay connected is to have synchronous classes. So that's a tension that I personally have been feeling. Our instructors shared um, that things are different. And so really letting students know that um, sometimes things are going to be different. Now, this particular, the familiarized students with these changes, this instructor, um, the course he's referring to is actually not required for our SUNY online programs. It's just a big course that they can take as an elective, um, but that also means that many of the students in that class have never taken a big online course before. And so, to so just let them know that it's different than when you take a class in person or a class at 36 students it's going to feel different. Um, the scale of the course is obviously always a challenge. Um, there's, just, there's just more to manage. Um, another challenge that faculty have pointed out was getting students to come and participate. And, and whether that's you know, come synchronously or even just show up for the class, I think that's a challenge a lot of people are experiencing right now is that they're registered for a class, but just being able to manage is, um, can, can be a challenge. There's a, lot, there's a lot of other distractions going on. Um, just the final two um, bits of challenges, and then I'm not sure if I'm taking questions now. Chuck, you'll tell me when we're taking questions. But um, our final two challenges are student apathy. Um, again, it, it's sort of the sort of getting students to show up piece is that there's just more students um, and more students to keep track of and follow up with. Um, and so our final bit of, uh, this is more really kind of advice, it's a, a challenge um, learned by experience, um, is to really keep your expectations appropriate. So just what we want students to understand the expectations are going to be a little bit different, really for faculty to also keep their expectations um, appropriate for that kind of scale, that you really do need to build in a little bit of time to catch up on that much grading and to catch up on um, missed assignments or excuses or all those different kinds of things just to sort of build that in. Um, so I think I am at time and that is my last slide. So I'm going to stop. There is a question for you, Jen, from Terry about, uh, Terry, do you want to? Sure. I was just wondering actually when you mentioned the, the one instructor in the large class, is that experience primarily Zoom synchronous? Cause you mentioned the TA letting people in and out or is it a combination of both? Yeah, that's, um, so most of the instructors that I just talked about are asynchronous courses. Um, that particular instructor 
the course that she was talking about was a, um, um, uh, I guess, high flex, I think is what you would call it, right? Um, um, but she has a lot of experience with online courses and is teaching in both of the programs. And so one of her big tips is really actually to use VoiceThread. She didn't include that here, um, but that sort of humanizing thing, she is our biggest proponent of VoiceThread. Cool, thanks, just wanna know what it looked like. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Jen, that's, that's really a good starting point for, for our, the, the others of our colleagues. So Danielle, you've, you have been working on in helping us all to think about <laughs> alternative program designs, compressed schedule courses, multiple starts, and more. And not only how to do that, but why? What are the benefits of, and, and reasons for doing it? So, Danielle? Sure, thank you, Chuck, and thank you everyone for being here today. Um, we have, yeah, at Alfred, been really thinking about this non-traditional student. And with COVID, pretty much every student has become a non-traditional student. They're all working, they all have families um, or other responsibilities that now they have to tend to. So in our online programs, particularly the healthcare management that we have for SUNY Online, uh, we, we did take a few um, items and we tried them out to see if they're working for our adult population. So having seven week courses was one of our first things that we really wanted to do. So for the fall and the spring semester, students enroll in seven week courses so they can take, there's two seven week sessions basically. And then there's also a winter session and three summer sessions that they can enroll in. Um, so that's eight total classes that they can take if they're just taking one course at a time, which our students feel like they're making a lot of progress when, we, when they can figure out that like, oh wow, I've done eight courses, but I've just taken one at a time. Um, so that ability to focus in on the individual courses has been really important for our students, um, especially with COVID, because so many of our students were going full-time and they were taking two classes in the first seven weeks and two classes in the seven second weeks. But going down to part-time, now they're, they're still completing two courses in a semester, but they are part-time students in, instead of one 15-week course. Um, that they're managing. So we've seen that um, really help us with, with the adult students, but also particularly with the COVID situations that a lot of them are finding themselves in. Um, and then there's a couple other things that we've done as far as the design of the program and supports. So I can talk about those quickly. Um, the advising piece. So our advisor is actually dedicated for our SUNY online program. And she works with the students to create their full degree plan. So our students know from the first time that they meet with this advisor, what their path is for their entire degree here at Alfred. And that gives them, like they say, hashtag goals, right? <laughs> so that they get to, to strive towards those goals and to stay on track. But it's nice because they can go back and they can readjust if something comes up or life happens, which it frequently does. So. Um, they can adjust their path and still have that end date and feel like they're getting somewhere. Uh, the advisor also does the registration for the students. And we've looked at this as a service to our adult population. We know that they have so many other things going on that if we can take that one registration and banner off of their plate, then that's just one less thing that they have to do to get into class. Um, so that's been really helpful for them. Um, and also helps us get students registered. Then um, the last two things are kind of together that I'll talk about is the course design along with our overall program design. So we've designed our program so that we're not offering more than five courses in each of our terms, which gives us the flexibility to have additional sections if we need to. But because we're using a master course model for development, or we're calling it anchor courses now, we're not supposed to be using master, right? <laughs> so um, that our anchor courses, then we can scale to as many sections as we need to. 
And that has really proven to be great for our students. They're all getting a similar experience in the program. And we only have to prep about five courses each term for, for the program. Uh, so, and we think that that's very scalable. Even if we have multiple programs, we'll be able to have overlapping courses if there's courses that cross, um, and we'll be able to use courses that have been developed for other programs to offer. So, um, overall, those are kind of the, the things that we've done for, um, for scaling. Is that an overview? Is that what you were looking for, Chuck? <laughs> that's pretty good. Okay. Um, that's pretty good. And by the way, I think Kim and I have begun using <laughs> template courses. Oh, okay. Template um, courses. Is a way to think about <laughs> it, but I like the anchor. We'll have to, uh, we'll have to put our heads together about that so okay. we, we, we have a common language um, or, or not. Um, but Molly has a question for you, Danielle, about... Sure. Go ahead, Molly. Um, is it hard to scale that registration? Danielle, how many people actually are the ones doing the registration for the students? Yep, so right now we have one full-time professional advisor who okay. is registering all of our students. And we are working on coming up with our magic number of when we add another professional advisor, right? Mm -hmm. um, and because our SUNY Online Coach is doing so much of the academic coaching, making sure that they're turning in assignments, those kinds of mm -hmm. things, um, the advisor is really able to have a pretty large caseload. Um, so right now it's just one person and we have um, 60 some students in our program. Okay. So Thanks. she'll be able to take a couple hundred, we think. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell her. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. Don't tell her. And from, <laughs> Camille, <she's> <laughs> from Camille, how does your dedicated advisor interact and interface with the SUNY online uh, student supports, the coaches and so forth? Sure. So our coach, uh, we are blessed because she's amazing. Um, and she works really closely both with our admissions office and with our advisor. So the admissions folks and our advisor meet weekly with the SUNY coordinator and she, um, I mean, they talk about everything from what do students need for success, where do we anticipate some bumps in the road with certain students. Um, it's really all focused on the success of the student whether it's how are we going to successfully get them to apply and finish their application, or how are we going to get them to get through this course that we know may be a little tough for them. So hopefully that answered it. I would, they, they talk more frequently than weekly, but they have a weekly um, appointment scheduled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And from Linda, if you don't mind, Linda, uh, for either you or, or Danielle, what's your largest online course, the highest enrollment, and have any of your instructors tied peer review to increase student-to-student -student interaction? Something that I'm very fond of and interested in. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so we actually have a policy on campus that our online course sections are capped at 25. Mm -hmm. So we still have very small courses, what we would consider small. Um, we're working on that. We're having that conversation to expand um, but yeah, we, we have lots of sections, but offering the same course. Okay, and Jennifer has responded in the chat. We'll let you keep offering questions and, and interacting in the chat, but we'll, we'll move on. And Molly, earlier, uh, Jen mentioned the use of TAs, and that's something you've done in the SUNY online environment, so. Oh, well, hi, everybody. Um, we, we launched our TA model early in our pilot when actually we didn't have those high, high enrollments, yet we approach using the TAs as if we did have a large class. And the reason why we did this is because our goal was to create a best practices framework so that when we did scale, we would have that in place. So we proceeded as if we had 300 students in the class. And in particular, what we wanted to use our TAs for was to address the biggest challenge in offering online scaled courses and that student engagement. So we had a very specific focus in launching this um, pilot model. How do you individualize and personalize a scale course? And how do you respond to students when there are so many? 
So essentially we had two buckets of thought, how to use TAs to help students and how to use TAs to help faculty. So in terms of the first bucket and helping students, I'm gonna tie back to what Jennifer said earlier, which is to use the TAs to humanize the courses. So you can use TAs to create social presence um, that ties back to humanizing, that ties back to personalizing the course, use TAs to reduce student apprehension, um, have them develop a voice early on through announcements, posting things, have them facilitate synchronous sessions. As Jennifer mentioned, having somebody there to kind of manage those interactions and technicalities, lead student groups. And if you're not using an AI um, tool like Packback, you can use them to you know, activate the discussions. In terms of the second bucket, which is using TAs to help faculty, this is where it also really changes and we have to rethink this because as you know, we mentioned in the first presentation, a lot of the stuff needs to be automated, like the grading. So what a faculty can use a TA for is actually quality assurance. Have that TA or those TAs in the course assess the materials, correct dates, dead links, navigation, is it user friendly? Um, it's a great way to spot all those things that can really um, derail a student and affect their student learning outcomes. Um, if you use the automated, then think of the TAs as like success coaches. They're the ones that are going to outreach the students having difficulty. And once again, we know that the students are at risk of being invisible. So if you tie that all together, you are rethinking how TAs can be used in this environment. And then to kind of um, give some takeaways, if you want to set these relationships up, the TA to student, TA to faculty, set those relationships up for success. A couple of things that you can do are, number one, introduce the TA immediately. Let them have the opportunity to develop that voice and make those connections and do that social presence and humanize the course. Um, and then when you're working with the TA, I think these are kind of standard um, expe expectations, whether it's face-to-face -face or online you know, standardize any type of assessment. Um, if they're doing rough drafts, are they using a grading rubric? Um, articulate the turnaround times. We know how important responsiveness is. So be very clear with the TA what those expectations are. Um, how to approach academic integrity issues. What's the protocol for that? Make sure that their roles are defined. And then once again, as Danielle mentioned, weekly meetings, whatever you're doing in this type of format are really important. Um, so looking at the big picture, we really recommend that you tie the use of the TA in a scaled online course to best practices in online instruction and design, and we all know what those best practices are. Social presence, responsiveness, consistent and ongoing feedback. This is where TAs can be very valuable. And, you know, we all try even harder to create that social presence online. So I think that is actually um, the gold of the TA for the future. How's that? Awesome, and what about tutoring? Do your, in the spirit of success coaching, do your TAs tutor? Um, you know, I guess you, you know, think about tutoring. If you already have a very um, robust tutoring support system, you may want them to go there or else you may want the um, tutor to be very specific and tutor on those assignments. I think it's really a conversation with the faculty, um, how you're gonna use tutoring and what you have already available for online tutoring. It could be a blend. Okay. It's really helpful to hire TAs that already took your course, if you can, because then they actually can help tutor specifically. Very good, very good. All right, thank you, Molly. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Terry, we have template courses or anchor courses, or thank you, Tanka, prototype courses. Um, take your pick or all of the above, but tell us how you are approaching these. Thank you. Um, 
so when we joined the SUNY online pilot, um, we have three degrees. We have um, business administration accounting, we have psychology, and we have math. And our challenge at the time, and actually this sort of answers Lisa's question too, um, and class size question, our class sizes are determined by our faculty contract. We don't have the ability right now to easily expand them. In some cases, that's good, because we have very small class sizes in face-to-face -face environments, and sometimes we have larger ones, which might be 45 or 50. But the challenge was, um, a year, not only about a year and a half ago, was that um, what happens if we get to scale and have a thousand new students for each of these degrees? How can we quickly offer enough sections and have enough faculty members trained and ready to go to be able to teach these? Um, so our approach at the time was to use this opportunity to, uh, to um, introduce the idea of template courses. And by template courses, what we mean is not that everybody's required to use this exact same template for their courses, but instead to make sure we have a well-developed course ready to go that meets all of the requirements for SUNY Online, um, has gone through the Oscar review, um, has all the quality elements we think are important, so that if at the last minute we have to add two, three, four, ten sections of something, and perhaps even hire some new faculty at the last minute to take on things, so that often happens in a face-to-face environment, we want to be able to give them something that's ready to go. So what we did is um, we rolled out a model um, that is based on about three levels. Uh, first of all, understand that every course that was going to be, that was part of this degree was already taught online. So we did have experienced faculty members with good courses, but they may not have all been in the same place. And our faculty contract also dictates that um, for courses where we've worked with faculty members to develop them, we have shared ownership for five years. So they get to teach it, we also get to use that version. Um, the problem is what happens after five years or what happens if they split or what happens with iterations. So we took this opportunity again um, for these template-based courses. It was a work for hire process where we took, um, the, the goal was that we have more than one faculty member working together um, because we did this in about two months. In many cases, it really was just one faculty member, but more than one faculty member working together to develop and take their course and develop a high quality online course that's ready to go. One of the key elements we added to this was the expectation that every one of these courses has a hidden folder in it with instructor information. So if you are adopting these courses, here's where you need to change, here's what you need to update, here's what you need to do to make it personalized and make it your own. Conversely, as they were developing these, we wanted them to take out elements that were all about them. So instead of saying, hi, I'm Professor Keyes, welcome to Professor Keyes' course, this is Professor Keyes, on and on and on. We looked at videos that were very personalized and tried to make them a little more general, and we tried to make sure the course is ready to go to hand off. Um, this worked really well for us. Um, what we did is we did it um, based on three different levels of where the course started. A and the stipends were commensurate with that. So we did pay the faculty members for this. A level one course was a high quality course that really just needed to meet the standards for SUNY Online. When I say just, there are some significant standards. It goes through a course review process to ensure ADA um, accessibility, to ensure that copyright is infringed, to ensure that it meets, um, that it uh, um, rolls over into the new template well. So ones that were pretty much ready to go accept those things, we paid at level one stipend, and our stipends weren't very much, 500, 1,000, 1,500 for levels one, two, and three. Level two courses were ones that had not gone through Oscar, uh, the Oscar rubric review yet, so we expected that they go through that and then do everything as part of level one. And level three courses were ones that required significant work, whether it's adopting um, OER text, whether it's adding lots of media and videos and things like that. Um, but we, we used those three levels. Um, it allowed us to compensate the faculty to some extent. We wish we could have done a lot more, but it was a, to a reasonable amount to get the work done. And it now gives us a master course that's ready to go as we do scale and rapidly approach hopefully those thousand students per degree as we move forward. Um, this model also is something that as the faculty, um, it, it made it easier for the chairs of those departments because they were very concerned again, what happens if we scale? Because we were all, we were all in a place of declining enrollments, not filling positions. So in these particular degree areas, again, at the last minute, if we get um, three, four, five more sections, and that happened to us for a couple of our courses, um, we could just turn them on and have it ready to go in less than a week's time. So I think that was very helpful for us. I can provide a lot more information, um, but that's where we are. And again, we're going to, 
hopefully adopt this model as you move forward because faculty see that it's very helpful to them um, for other courses they're teaching as well. So um, we'll keep it going if we can. Okay, very good. And again, let's, let's invite you to um, interact with Terry and, and other panelists in the chat, but we'll, we'll move on. And Francesca, um, we have a, a, an initiative led by Frank Vanderbalk, who's working with us in SUNY Online um, uh, from Empire, uh, who's leading a, a commons approach, right, around social justice. And we're very excited to have uh, four campuses involved in several courses. Um, but that model is based on something you all did last summer uh, with COIL. So uh, we're, we're eager yeah. to hear more from you about, about what you did and, and how it went. I'll be happy to do that. Thanks, Chuck. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I hope that you can see it. Let's see here. Not yet. Not um, yet. Oh, here we go. Yep. Okay. Great. Okay. All right. Are you able to see? Great. Um, so um, I'm presenting on um, a, a recent collaborative course model um, that um, we we completed this past summer, summer 2020. Um, this was a response to a SUNY-wide problem, and in so many ways, it was the collective ingenuity of all the SUNY campuses coming together to solve this, this um, problem, which was um, that study abroad was canceled um, and pretty well quashed any travel for students outside the US uh, beginning spring 2020. And so um, many of us across SUNY believed that um, students um, really did deserve to have a virtual study abroad experience um, and that we came together to create that for them in summer 2020, this past July, during a six week uh, pilot sort of program. And that was called um, SUNY COIL Global Commons Virtual Study Abroad. So the goal really was um, to, um, to have students contribute to global sustainability, completing small groups, uh, small group projects with uh, not-for-profit organizations internationally. So they, they worked with um, organizations from Africa to Israel uh, on sustainable development goal focused projects. Um, the structure of the program, the six week program was rather complicated. So um, that's why I'm relying on some slides here. Um, students who participated in the course registered um, for two four credit courses during the six week term. The first was intercultural storytelling um, and that was um, designed by faculty from across SUNY, um, but offered through SUNY Empire. And students then had another choice and they, uh, they picked one of uh, many different courses that focused on specific sustainable development goals. Um, and you can see them here listed. Um, each one of these courses was taught by a different SUNY campus. Um, and many of those campuses are represented here today. Um, shout out to UAlbany, MCC, um, lots of my colleagues here today. The structure of the course was, was also pretty ambitious. Um, and so students began in weeks one and two um, engaging in the intercultural storytelling course. Um, they then took on um, the, the second of those two courses, the international perspectives on the SDGs in weeks, um, in the weeks two and three. And then they engaged in very intensive project-based group work, synchronously and asynchronously, applying the principles they learned in the intercultural storytelling course, along with the perspectives on uh, sustainable development goals to projects that their individual international partners had essentially given them um, during a, a brief. Um, because this is a group of practitioners, I thought I'd focus on how did this all come together? What was the connective glue? 
um, that made such an ambitious collective kind of project work across SUNY. Um, so we, um, we took a couple of core concepts. One was that um, we, we really did think that the study abroad infrastructure that had already existed across SUNY could be useful to us. And that per permitted um, some flexibility in registration and credit transfer. So students registered for all six credits at their home campus. Um, and then of course we had centralized support through the SUNY Office of Global Affairs and the COIL team for an online registration portal. The courses were administered by very different SUNY institutions and um, those faculty, that sort of division of labor, um, each faculty member was hired by their own home campus. Oops. All of the courses were hosted in the SUNY online space. So we had direct assistance from the SUNY online team for student enrollment um, that allowed for ease of use for students and faculty, single sign-on, and of course this common area for support and um, technical assistance. Um, our own team at SUNY Online, Frank Vanderwalk, in my office in international education, we, um, we provided some more connective glue for our SUNY colleagues. Um, and Frank's group really um, came to the table with instructional design framework, right? The build out and the support for all of the courses. Um, and we worked hand in glove with um, the, the COIL team. But we did devote um, two full-time SUNY Empire instructional designers for eight weeks. Um, so two weeks of very intensive um, in course design before the program began. Um, some things that I think really helped us were these collective structures, I'm calling them. Um, OER was foundational from the very beginning of this project. All of the student resources were OER, um, and, and each of the faculty members was asked to sign off on their course content so that that could be uploaded later on and used as a, a completely free resource. So an OER archive has been developed with all of the course content. We had a concierge model, which really meant that um, volunteers from across SUNY provided direct support for students and faculty throughout the course, in addition to the faculty who were hired to teach the courses. Our own registrar um, took on quite a, a lot of work. Um, again, this sort of um, centralized um, model did help us uh, when dealing with such a complicated structure. And she recorded all of the course grades and produced transcript supplements, just as we would for study abroad. And then um, those, those course outcomes transferred back to the student's home campus for recording. And I'm going to exit here, stop my share, and um, take, take some questions as well. Very good. Thank you, Francesca. Sure. Francesca? Sure, I I just have a quick question. Um, what's, what feedback did you get from the students? Because you know, um, probably when they initially had their study abroad plans kiboshed, that's tough. Um, so what, what did you hear from them, you know, after involving them in this? Um, well, I, you know, thanks for that question because um, the outcomes, the student outcomes were nothing short of transformative. Uh, we received amazingly positive feedback from students who really craved um, the sort of interaction, meaningful engagement in a global project. Mm -hmm. Those sustainable development goals really provided that framework. But they got to work with these international partners in a way that they might not even have had during a study abroad experience. Yeah. Um, and it was amazingly um, successful. Mm -hmm. We were very surprised that so many students had um, such great experiences. So, you know, just thinking of creating this, actually front loading it, and then they actually, when COVID goes away, they can actually go and meet each other. I mean, like it could actually be a two step model in the future. That's wonderful. And some of them, Molly, some of them have. Um, <laughs> have internships and invitations to work with some yeah. of the NGOs in an ongoing capacity. 
um, which they found just very empowering um, at the end of this experience. So it's networking. They actually were able to, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. I would, I would encourage all of you to go to the, the COIL um, Global Commons website because there are examples of student okay. projects there. Um, and Erin provided the link, so it's convenient. Great. Thank you, Erin. Thank you. Thank you. Erin, you have uh, some final thoughts for us, I think. Sure. Uh, thanks, Chuck. We'll just uh, wrap this up. This is uh, just some great conversation um, happening in the chat as well. So um, I want to be sure to draw your attention there and make sure that all of our questions got answered. So I'll, I'll keep the slides running for a bit. Um, but I just want to thank all of our panelists for not only volunteering to do this, <laughs> but for all the great work that you've been doing. Um, with your programs and um, and the the service that this provides to students, it's just fantastic. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us for this last session for National Distance Learning Week. And um, we have the slides uh, and recordings of every session uh, posted on our our Bitly there that website. We have a survey that we would invite you to fill out for us. It just helps inform future offerings and topics that you, you may be interested in learning more about. And uh, the USDLA has events going on all week as well. Their website is, is full of just a wealth of resources. So thank you very much to Kim for giving us an overview and to Chuck for his great facilitation. And we, uh, we appreciate you all attending. So I will stop the recording and just wish you all well. Thanks, Harry. Thank you, Kim. <laughs>